ladies and gentlemen, we have been lied to, or at least misled. When it comes to weight loss, fat loss, transforming our bodies, there are so many myths out there and there's so much conflicting information. I mean, some experts will have you doing more cardio. Sometimes you'll hear it's calories in versus calories out. You've got to strength train. You've got to cut out sugars. No, it's intermittent fasting. There's so much conflicting information out there and so many experts who look the part, so therefore we think we should follow their advice. But I'm here to tell you that it's just not that simple, but it is far less complicated than we sometimes make it. And today I am very excited to bring on one of my favorite people and one of the leading experts when it comes to debunking the myths of weight loss and sustained weight loss, sustained fat loss, and what it actually takes to transform your body forever. Today, we're gonna boil it down with my guest, Sal Di Stefano. Before we get started, let me tell you a little bit about our guest today. First of all, I love this guy because he's honest, he's real, and he's raw. Sal has more than 20 years experience in the fitness industry. Starting at age 18, he has trained thousands of people in the gym, like on the front lines, understands what it takes to get people results. He has owned fitness studios, trained other personal trainers. He's an incredible businessman. He and his team have developed these amazing fitness routines that are so incredibly sound, you're actually gonna feel like you're working out with a personal trainer. I respect his real, raw, honest opinion. I love that he has debunked so much of the BS that is out there in the world of consumer fitness. But more importantly, I love his approach to health and understanding you've just got to meet people where they are. You've got to help people make changes that they can sustain forever. And that's really what we talk about today in this episode. I mean, we talk about everything from Ozempic to strength training, intermittent fasting, nutrition, therapy, trauma, everything, because all of those things make up who we are. And all of those things, all of those reasons are why for some people it is more difficult than others not just to lose the weight, but to keep it off long-term, like anyone can lose the weight. And in this episode, we really break it down and make it very clear the six elements that are so critical for anyone to have sustained long-term permanent weight loss, and not just weight loss, like to be healthy. What does it mean to be healthy? So you're in store for an excellent episode. Without further ado, Sal Di Stefano. Sal, thank you so much for joining me today for this conversation. I'm really looking forward to it. I am too. We had such a great time when we met you. You're um, actually became quickly one of our favorite people. So it's an honor to come on your show. Yeah, but I have told many people, I actually did a podcast about that podcast saying like that was one of the most um, uh, forthcoming and in-depth podcasts I've ever done. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that we have so much shared experience. So you kind of knew questions to ask me that no one else thinks to ask. Yeah, you're, um, I mean, you're an important figure in the space. You've been doing this for a long time. You've worked with a lot of people. You're very authentic. So for people watching, when you meet, uh, when you meet Shalene, she is, she's like, like, I, as you would expect, she's very real, very straightforward. Um, and so we connect very strongly with people like that. There's not a lot of people, uh, unfortunately, like that. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, when we sat down with you, it was, it was just, it was automatic. It was easy. It was an easy conversation. Um, to have with you. So, and I'm sure that's, that's one podcast, but I'm sure we'll have more for sure. <laughs> well, I appreciate that, you know, um, because to, to start off for those people who uh, don't know, we, we have a lot in common other than what I shared in the intro about your background, et cetera. But like, even just having spent years in personal training and mm -hmm. kind of the metamorphosis that you explained how you used to think of your clients and how you used to treat them. And I just think about so many of the clients that I had, and I always was looking for like the right way to train someone. It took me quite a while to figure out that every single one of them is going to be completely different. Yeah. Um, that took me a long time to figure out. I, I would say probably cause I, I trained people for over two decades, mm -hmm. uh, managing gyms. I owned a wellness studio at one point. Um, and I had, I would train trainers and all that, but I also trained clients that whole time. And I probably was terrible. I don't want to say probably. I was terrible <laughs> for the first for the first five years at least, because you you know as a fitness fanatic, you get into fitness for a lot of different reasons. Many of us get into it because we love it, but also because of our own body image issues or maybe mm -hmm. insecurities. And then we think to we think we apply fitness to people the same way we applied it to ourselves. 
Um, and that just doesn't, it just doesn't work that way. But thankfully I also love people like you. I really want to help people. And yeah. so that was always my guiding light. So there were a lot of, um, a lot of times where I had to look in the mirror and say, okay, you know, am I really helping people? Like, I'm, I don't think I'm not as successful as maybe let's say my numbers show in, in the gyms or whatever. Like people are still dropping off. People are still not able to, to, to maintain this, um, lifelong relationship. What am I doing wrong? So it was a constant conversation, but it drove me to really figuring out how to do this the right way uh, for most people. It took a long time uh, to do that. So, you know, I, I, I always, I say this on my show, probably, I don't know, I've already, at least a hundred times, <laughs> I apologize to those initial clients. It's a, yeah. I was not a great trainer in the beginning, um, but I got better later on as I really started to figure this out. How did you handle it? Uh, it was awkward for me and it took some time to figure out that some of the people who are probably it was the easiest for them to afford me. They really weren't looking for results. They, they wanted to be able to say, you know, check off that box. Like I've, I've exercised twice this week. I have a trainer. I worked out like, and they, but they're getting results, changing anything that wasn't part of their objective. And, and yeah. that took me some time to like come to grips with like, okay, I also have to put food on the table. This is like, you know, back in the day, day, I'm like, I got to be okay with the fact that they, they just want to, they sometimes just want me to come here and, and, uh, count and, and, and just have someone to talk to so that they can say they worked out, so they can say they have a trainer. And I just have to let go of the fact that they're not going to get the results I'd like for them to get. Yeah. That I remember when that happened, when I, uh, actually I, I tell this story all the time. I had a woman that I trained and I feel so bad for this. I hope she hears one of the times I talked about her because I'd love to apologize to her. But, um, you know, I, I trained her for a while. She would keep a food log for me and I, you know, help her with her calories and all that. And she just wasn't progressing. I also trained her husband oh. and I don't know, about six months into it, her husband took me aside and said, Hey, Sal, I just want to let you know that she's not really putting everything on her food log that she's eating. And so I was like, what is Oh, great. Plan? I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to have this like come to Jesus talk with her. And she comes in and I let her have it. And I told her, you got to be honest with me and we're here to get results, this and that. And she got really upset, got a bit emotional, and she left, and she never came back. Mm. And I felt, for a short period of time, I felt like good, like vindicated, like yeah, you know, you need if you're if you got to be serious if you're here to do this. And then I realized she's not working out at all, mm. and she's probably not going to work out for a long time or maybe ever because um, of that that experience. And so I really didn't, you know, I, I did a terrible job at really helping her because at least she was showing up, right? At least she was doing some exercise. At least she was moving and improving her strength and mobility. So that that sticks out. There's also times when I realize that there's a lot more that you get from fitness than just the weight going down the scale mm. or, you know, building new, you know, changing the way your body looks. In fact, if I were to ask you, give me the top five reasons why you continue to exercise, I bet you the way you look won't make the top five at this point, right? You've been doing it for so long. It's like my mental space. It helps me with my mental space. It's, it's, it helps you know, me with I would say it is, I'm gonna, not going to lie, but it is in the top five for me, um, how I look, uh, but not weight. It, it is definitely mm. not for weight, but, but how I look like, I, I feel like people who exercise look younger. They, they move better. Um, they look more confident. They have better posture. So like, I, I don't necessarily mean like m my, physique specifically but that's part of the equation i think people right. your skin looks better i think you sleep like I you know what you're explaining what you're explaining health yeah so that's, that's what i mean that's what i mean yeah. like you know it, it, it's different right it's like you start to realize that uh fitness provides all these other amazing things that improve the quality of your life um and i had to really put that together and figure that out and you know because you would get this you would get two challenges one the client that doesn't see the results because they're not doing the stuff on their own. Yep. And then two, the one that gets results, but then wants endless results forever, which is impossible. Mm. And they lose their motivation because, uh, like I, I want to get even leaner or I want to keep moving or I want to do this new competition and they end up chasing fitness. Like it's this addiction. Yeah. Um, and so, um, if you want to develop a lifelong relationship with exercise, uh, it's, it, you have to really realize all of its true benefits, which include things like, your mental state. Uh, it's antidepressive. Um, in fact, uh, they just, I mean, a study just came out showing that it's as effective, if not more effective for mild to moderate forms of depression as SSRIs. Yeah. Uh, for anxiety as, as effective as, uh, you know, some of the top medications. It's a pro personal growth vehicle. Yeah. So definitely a gateway drug for that. 
it, I mean, you pursue it long enough and you have to learn a lot of lessons. You have to learn body acceptance. You know, everybody talks about body acceptance. Look, you work out long enough and at some point you realize you're not going to look that, like that person on the magazine or you're not going to be the number one strongest person or whatever, but then you keep doing it anyway because you start to accept maybe your limitations, your body, maybe your schedule. Um, you, you develop a good relationship with pain. You know, it hurts, but I mean, workouts for you and me hurt just as much as they do for, for anybody else but we don't shy away from the pain. It doesn't bother us the same way because we've de developed a different relationship. God, the carryover into life with something like that is amazing. So it, it provides all these incredible benefits. And so I eventually learned how to really teach and coach clients uh, to connect the dots on that. And then it became something that they did because they cared about themselves because they enjoyed it, uh, not because they needed to lose necessarily these 10 pounds because they hate the way I look, yeah. which is a very short-term, not good relationship building approach. I think of exercise as self care now. I used to think totally. of it as uh, you know part of my job. I used to think of it as something I had I had to do for weight maintenance, weight control. Um, I I didn't necessarily do it to punish myself. I've always 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 loved exercise, but it did get to a place where I didn't love. I I hated the way I felt, and mm -hmm. you know, and obviously I've told that story many times on the show. But what's interesting about the conversation I want to have with you is I think things have really shifted and changed. I think we're beginning to realize, and, and so is the consumer, that it doesn't have to be as intense. It doesn't have to be as hard. It doesn't have to be as brutal. You don't have to kill yourself. And frankly, we're as fitness professionals, I think we're seeing a lot of us saying, you know, we also have to admit it, it's a very small percentage of what enters into the equation of health. Yes. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, to put it simply, exercise is a stress on the body and what your body does is it, it takes on the stress and then it repairs and heals from the stress mm -hmm. and then it adapts so that next time the same insult doesn't provide the same stress, right? So this is why yeah. you get stronger. So, you know, if I did five push ups this week and that was hard, my body adapted and now I could do five push-ups without causing damage. That's why I then do six push-ups or seven push-ups to continue that 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 progress moving along. Mm -hmm. So the question then becomes, well, what's the appropriate level of stress? Because if I over apply stress, what ends up happening is I don't adapt. My body only prioritizes healing. Okay. Right. So healing and adaptation are actually two different things. So I can I can heal my body. Um, or I can tell my body to heal and then adapt and get stronger. If I overcome my body's ability to adapt, it's just going to heal. So what does that look like? Well, that can look like um, the following. It can look like I work out, get sore, rest, go back to the gym, work out, get sore, rest, go back to the gym, and I never progress. Mm -hmm. I call this the, uh, the, the breakdown recovery trap. Mm -hmm. There's no progress because I'm overcoming my body's ability to adapt. Okay, so what's the appropriate level of stress? It depends on the person. Mm -hmm. If you're doing no exercise now, well, a little bit more than you're doing now is enough. That's a good point. That's a really good point. You know, and, and I was listening. I love your book on Audible. Um, by the way, we'll mention that and put it in our show notes as well, especially for anyone who's like really interested. And I think it's really profound the way you educate people around not like just why strength training is so important, resistance training, whatever you want to call it, um, but also what you need to know about it because it's so intimidating for a lot of people. But anyway, yeah. my, my, what I was going to say is that my ears perked up when I heard you say, um, and forgive me if I'm misquoting, but I think you said something like two to three days of strength training. And I was like, what? Like two to three. So for me, I don't like telling people two to three days because I know it's going to be hard for them to get that two to three days. So it'll end up being one to two days. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. and I, you know, maybe explain to me your perspective on setting the bar at a level like two to three days. Yeah. Well, I'm communicating, you know, I worked with everyday average people for, for years and years. I, I did work with some advanced people, um, athletes and fitness fanatics, mm -hmm. but the average person, um, wants to, wants to get fit to improve the quality of their life. They're not looking to make fitness their life like I have. Like fitness is, is part of my life, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a part of what I do. But most people, like I want to do this so I can feel better, I can look better, I have better health, but I don't want it to be this all-consuming thing. Uh, so, so that's number one. Number two, um, in my experience working with clients, I got to the point where I got really good at helping people develop this lifelong relationship with exercise. 
but it always averaged out to about two or three days a week. Any more than that, and I'm dealing with a small percentage of people that become fitness fanatics. And there are some people that become fitness fanatics. But for the average person, what we need to do is figure out how can we make two or three days a week effective? How can we take two or three days a week and make it so that it actually produces um, good results, both with health and with body composition? And so that was my goal. That was always my goal. So, And when you, and I'm sorry to interrupt, but when you say two to three days, is that two to three days of strength training? Yeah. And and so how many days a week would you prescribe that, that average person, as you described them, uh, to exercise, like to, to do some type of exercise activity? Yeah. So that's, that's a great question. So uh, there's two parts to this. One is it's great. It's a great idea to be active every single day. Okay. But we don't need to schedule exercise on a daily basis. In fact, the studies show that it's far more effective if you uh, insert activity into your everyday life. You're more likely to be consistent and the body actually progresses faster and better that way. So like they've done studies where they'll have some people do 60 minutes of cardio mm-hmm. or they'll do like three sessions of 20 minutes. Well, mm-hmm. the three sessions, even though they equal the same amount of, uh, of time, they actually produce better results. So how does this all of that translate to the average person? Well, instead of telling people to do 30 minutes of cardio a day, because you know moving is good for you and we're all so sedentary, right? Modern life is very sedentary. I would do something like uh, after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, go for a 10-minute walk. Mm -hmm. I mean, how much easier is it to be consistent for the average person to do like a 10-minute walk after breakfast, lunch, and dinner versus scheduling a 30-minute walk or a 30-minute bout on the treadmill, right? Right. So that's the daily part. The daily part is is something like that. Mm -hmm. Now, strength training, why did I pick strength training? You know, a long time ago, and I understand why we, we have this um, misunderstanding. So when the obesity epidemic became a thing, the you know scientists came out and said, okay, here's the issue. The issue is we're eating too many calories and not burning enough. And so what happens is you have this, what's called this energy imbalance, and the excess calories can't just disappear, right? This, this is a law of physics. Your body stores those calories. This is how you gain body fat. So if you burn more Excuse me, if you take in more than you burn, Mm -hmm. you gain weight. If you take in less than you burn, then you lose weight. Okay, now it's more complicated than that in terms of whether or not it's muscle or fat or how I feel, all that stuff. Yeah. But that basic thing I just said is a fact. It's the second law of thermodynamics. It's just how it works. Okay, so what they did is they said, you know, this thing, which is very true. And then they looked at the calories outside and they said, okay, we got to burn more calories. Well, the way that we should rank exercise or activity then is on calorie burn. What form of exercise burns the most calories? That's going to make it the most valuable. But this is uh, totally wrong. It's a distorted view of exercise because it ignores the most important factor, which is how does this form of exercise get my body to adapt? And then what do those adaptations mean? What do those adaptations mean? So I'm going to bring up a study that's going to illustrate a little bit about what I'm talking about. There's this remarkable study I quote in the book where scientists went and studied the Hadza tribe. This is a tribe in northern Tanzania. Mm-hmm. They're modern hunter-gatherers. So they live the way that we did, you know, 50,000 years ago, okay? They don't have electronics. They hunt, <laughs> and they gather. Right. So they're they're way more active than the average western couch potato. Yep. Okay, so scientists went down, and they studied this tribe. And one of the things that they did in the study was, through sophisticated testing, they tested their metabolic rates and how many calories they burned every single day. And to their surprise, Hadza tribes people burned roughly the same amount of calories as the average Western couch potato. Now, I see you shaking your head because you're like, how is that possible? Mm-hmm. Well, here's why. The human body adapted and evolved this way because if our bodies burned 6,000 calories a day every single day hunting and gathering, we would have never survived. Go try finding 6,000 calories in nature. But with pre-modern right. agriculture, definitely pre-grocery store, it's not going to happen. We're going to die. So what does the body do? With that type of activity, the body initially burns a lot of calories, but then it learns how to become more efficient. That's right. It actually teaches itself to burn less calories. And there's a, there's a few things that it does, and one of them is it pairs muscle down. So if you look why muscle is very calorically expensive, okay, it costs a lot of calories. So if you look at studies, for example, on diet and cardio, cardio mimicking more closely to what like uh, modern hunter-gatherers would do, they don't do much strength training. It's lots of running and walking, right? If you you look at studies on cardio plus calorie restriction, you see weight loss, but almost half the weight is muscle. Right. 
And that's because the body is trying to slow down its metabolism. Which explains so for, the massive weight gain when we go off. When we go off and why we lose 15 pounds. And then in order to lose more weight, I got to eat less and I got to work out more. Like this is, yeah, yeah. this cycle is, is unsustainable, right? So the calorie burn model is, is a terrible model. How many calories you burn while you exercise is inconsequential. Don't worry about that. What you want to look at is the adaptations. So the reason why strength training is so valuable for the modern human is because it's the only form of exercise that has been proven to significantly speed up the metabolism through the process of muscle building. You get a faster metabolism, meaning I'm sitting here burning more calories than I did before because I have more muscle and more strength. It's like I'm doing all this extra activity. My body actually learns to become less efficient mm. with calories. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you can make significant progress in that direction by both building muscle and by also just just telling the body to build muscle actually starts to move your body in that direction. So it's like I could teach my body to burn less calories or I could teach it to burn more calories. And in a modern lifestyle where I'm not going to move much and my lifestyle is busy and I'm probably not going to work out all the time, like a faster metabolism where it used to be a liability 50,000 years ago. You don't want a fast metabolism right. as a hunter. As a modern human, you want a faster metabolism. This makes it a lot easier to lose weight and keep it off. You can eat more and keep the weight off. I think that's why so many of my uh, listeners are at this stage where they, they've been with me on this journey. They were with me when I was, you know, no days off. I, mm. I did this fitness camp that was called Camp Do More. Like literally, you need to exercise more, do more. Um, I was exercising three, four hours a day, you know, only eating processed protein shakes, protein bars, you know, like anything that came in a package, because then I knew exactly what my calories were. Um, and then it, I slowly started to reverse that process. You know, once I did my brain scan, once I realized that I, I wasn't healthy and I felt like a fraud and I slowly started to reverse that process. But I don't think a lot of women have, I think they still are like, Oh man, I'm, I'm gaining some weight. I got to go back to my old ways and I'm going to eat less and I'm going to exercise more. And a lot of that means like doing more cardio, not always strength training. I also think that a lot of people assume that they've got to exercise for long periods of time. And I also think that, um, I mean, so right now I'm really kind of like describing the woman who's, you know, over 40. And now it's just like, this is a battle. Maybe she's even 50 and she's just like, I, I, I'm, they always say I'm doing everything the same, but I put on 15 pounds. Yes. Um, but maybe you are doing everything the same, but probably not. I mean, let's face it, probably not. It, it wouldn't make sense um, if you were there's because it's not maintainable. That's why I don't believe that people are doing exactly the same thing. Number one, number two, I don't think women are lifting heavy enough. I don't. Or, um, you know, like we, we say, like, we tell people how many reps to do, but we don't tell them what that should feel. And also we, we, we really don't teach women how to lift heavy and do so safely. Yeah. Women, women, um, have been lied to the most and damaged the most by the fitness industry. And, and just a okay. short, here's a short story. Why? Okay. When gyms first existed, these, there were gymnasiums. These were, you know, athletes would go in there and gymnasts mm -hmm. and then they targeted men. Right, you, you know, pumping iron came out in the 1970s. Yeah, there was a there was a bodybuilding um, documentary, and it was it was it was guys in there trying to build huge muscles. Well, well, gyms eventually figured out. Look, if we want to make this a business, we have to target women. That's the largest. Look, women are in most markets the largest consumer base. Okay, this is just a fact. Yep. So Jim said, "How are we going to do that?" Well, they they started creating terminology like toned. Yeah. Like muscles don't tone. They build oh, or they there. shrink. Please <laughs> uh, explain that because that drives me crazy when I hear people say like, yeah. I, I definitely want to lift, but I, I don't want like big muscles. I want toned muscles. Yeah. Muscles, they build or shrink. And, and the, the, the word tone refers to muscles that feel more firm. That's a muscle that built a little bit. Okay. That's all it is. So um, they started using that terminology. They started coming out with the, the pink and purple dumbbells and they said, mm -hmm. oh, you know what? You can lift weights, but you don't want to look big like that bodybuilder. So why don't you do 500 reps? And why don't you feel the burn? This is what's going to do it for you. So you did yeah. cardio with weights, essentially, is what you did. Yeah, yeah. And so women were just systematically lied to um, because gyms had to figure out how to attract um, how to attract women. So let me cover this because this myth still persists um, with with feet with women. Number one, this is important to note: muscle is more dense than body fat. Okay, so what does that mean? 
That means if, if your average viewer right now were to lose 10 pounds of body fat and gain 10 pounds of muscle, on the scale, you would weigh the same. But you would lose about a quarter of the size, okay? So 10 pounds of muscle takes up about three-fourths, roughly, maybe a little more of the space that the same amount of body fat does. So body fat, big and fluffy, muscle, dense and firm. Right. So even though you'd weigh the same, you're smaller. You're much smaller. So that's number one. Number two, to build the kind of muscles that women are afraid of, where they look at pictures, they go, I don't want to build, like, I'm not trying to look like that. You're not going to. It's not going to happen. The, the type of genetics that a woman would need to possess to build the kind of muscles where women look at it and go, wow, that looks scary, yeah. are so rare. It's as rare as uh, seven foot tall genetics. Mm -hmm. Okay, so like, like yeah. how often do you see someone walking around that seven foot tall? Besides going to NBA game, never, <laughs> right? right? Right, right, right. So that's, that's how extreme those genetics are. And if you're a woman and you got those genetics, you know because you're the strongest person always around yeah. in your family. You're and probably you stronger than your husband. nearly as much as anyone else. Yeah, so, but, so that's not you. So you're not going to build these crazy amounts of muscle. Um, and even those people, when we look at them in Instagram or whatever, not only they have those genetics, but they also take anabolic steroids, so it's mm. male hormones. Yeah. Most women, even if you train like a bodybuilder, ate like a bodybuilder, you know, five years of that, what you're going to get is the body that most women want or they think they can get from doing cardio, which is sculpted and tight. Round butt, nice hamstrings, tight midsection. That's what you'll end up getting. But there's, there's more to this, that's, and this is one of the most important things that I like to communicate because, number one, it's a good selling point. And I love good selling points because one of the most important skills that a good coach or trainer has is our ability to sell what we're trying to get people to do. Because if I have a client, their success is going to be largely based on whether or not they follow through with what I tell them to do and they adopt it. If they don't, it's just not going to happen. I'm the expert. I know it works. Can I get this person to really, really understand what I'm communicating? So here's a selling point, and this is 100% true, backed by data. When you tell your body to build muscle or when you tell your body to lose muscle, how do you tell your body to lose muscle? You don't feed it enough, so I cut my calories way down. A lot of people do this to try and lose weight, and they do excessive cardio. Mm -hmm. Excessive cardio tells my body to pair muscle down because, remember, it wants to slow down its metabolism. If I do that, my body organizes its hormones to make that happen. If I tell my body to build muscle, it'll also organize its hormones to do so. Okay. What does a hormone profile that promotes muscle building in a woman look like? Balance, estrogen and progesterone, testosterone in the higher range. By the way, testosterone, people think it's the male hormone. It's just as important for women as it is for men. The only difference is men have much higher levels than women. But low testosterone in women presents the same thing as it does in men. Low libido, low motivation, low muscle tone, excess body fat, all those things. So yeah. women need to have adequate testosterone, just like men need to have adequate estrogen. It's also right. very important. They're just different levels. So balanced estrogen and progesterone, good testosterone levels, probably the kind you had when you were a teenager and you just seemed to be able to burn calories off. And growth hormone, that's higher, growth hormone, that youth hormone, and um, a nice balanced cortisol spectrum, right? Cortisol high in the morning, tapers off in the evening. And thyroid, thyroid mm. hormones that are balanced. Yeah. That's the pro-muscle building hormone profile. What is the anti-muscle building hormone uh, profile? Low testosterone, high cortisol, low growth hormone, and estrogen and progesterone that are imbalanced. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you want to promote a youthful hormone profile, one of the best things you could do is tell your body to build muscle and feed your body to do so. Fuel your body to do so with adequate nutrition, adequate protein, a good, healthy, balanced diet. That'll make those hormones organize in a very anabolic, youthful way. And the data is extremely clear in this. In fact, strength training not only does that, but there's something quite unique about strength training that um, is, uh, in, in my view, even more important. It upregulates what are called androgen receptors. Okay, so androgen receptors, these are the the receptors that the testosterone attaches to. Mm -hmm. It's like the it's like the lock, testosterone is the key, and then it tells it allows the testosterone to do what it does. And again, in women, it's just like in men, it tells them to build a little bit of muscle, burn body fat, better libido, more motivation, drive, confidence, all that stuff. Well, lifting weights or doing strength training properly, I want to say that because you could always do something improperly, right? Right. Do it properly. 
you get more androgen receptors. So your hormone levels, they change to become more youthful and they become more effective mm. in the body. Mm -hmm. So this is, these, are, these are the primary reasons why I communicate that form of, of, of exercise, especially to women. It was like, it was like my, um, this was like my, 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 my secret weapon. I would get female clients and thankfully I'm, I can be quite convincing and I can come across as like, you know, like, like, believe me. Right. Right. And I would get these women who many of them never lifted weights or never trained strength training. A lot of them were just cardio fanatics or group exercise fanatics. And I convinced them to trust me and we would do these wonderful blocks, you know, 12, 16 week blocks of heavy, proper, appropriate strength training. And oh my God, they would be blown away. My favorite mm -hmm. was this. My favorite would be they'd get on the scale uh, and I'd let them weigh themselves infrequently. The, the weighing yourself every week, that'll mess with your head. So I'd say, okay, every month we'll get on the scale. They'd get on the scale. They'd be like, man, my my, my weight stay, it hasn't gone down. Then we would do a body fat test. They'd be like, well, you actually lost five pounds of body fat and gained five pounds of muscle. And then we'd show, we'd see a picture side by side. And they'd be like, oh my God, I look so different. Mm. And people keep commenting that I look like I lost 10 pounds. Yeah. And my husband has been saying this about me. And yeah. I noticed my libido is through the roof and my energy is so much better. Um, and it was from the strength training. Yeah. And it's just, it's this, it's this, uh, incredible form of exercise that is underutilized, especially by women. But if done properly, boy, does it. And, and now, why, why two or three days a week? Here's the beauty of strength training: you don't need to do it very often. Strength training is about sending the signal and then letting your body adapt. It's not about just sitting here trying to burn calories. Mm. Send the signal, let your body adapt. In fact, you could get quite how many advanced. Days do you, as someone who's in the advanced category, how many days a week do you lift? Oh, like lift, lift, three, three, four. Mm -hmm. um, now I do mobility. Um, I'll do stretching. Um, I'll do other activity. I love exercise. Yeah. But like real traditional strength training, I mean, right. three, four days a week and I'm a fanatic, you know, and I, you know, I, I'm, you know, I, I do pretty well. I'm not nowhere near like I'm a fanatic. Week. What do you mean? I'm a fanatic. What is that? Oh, it's, point? it's, I don't, I don't miss workouts. Uh, I love meaning it. it's, it's what it's your self care. Yeah. I mean, this is my career. Yes. This is, this is my career. I made this as a, this is my passion is, is mm -hmm. that's what I mean by fitness fanatic. I absolutely love it. Um, but yeah, three, four days a week and, and, um, you know, and look, good strength coaches will tell you this. You ask a good strength coach, can somebody get pretty advanced with a three day a week routine? And they'll tell, they'll say, oh yeah, absolutely. 100%. Well, let me ask you, can somebody get pretty advanced with a three day a week routine if they don't have, um, some of the other important elements in place, if, if their sleep is off, and if just, let's just say these two sleep, not getting enough sleep and, uh, the nutrition isn't dialed in, it, it, they, they don't change anything about their nutrition. Are they going to see results? Yeah. Okay. Um, the engine is very important to a car. Are you going to drive very far without the wheels? <laughs> yeah. So, so these are all, uh, crucial components to health. And if you're not good at getting good sleep, your body's in a constant state of stress. It's not going to want to adapt. If your diet isn't good, you're not going to feed or fuel your body the way that it should, um, and it's not going to want to adapt as well. Like you know, it's like exercise provides the plans, so it's like you're it's like you're building a building. You have a construction mm -hmm. plans. Here's the plans. That's the strength training. Then the workers show up, but you don't give them any bricks or steel or wood. That's the nutrition. So they're going to yeah. sit around looking at the plans, and we can't do anything. So you got to do all of them. But I don't want people to to come away thinking they have to do everything perfect. That's so yeah. far from the truth. What you got to do is a little bit better than you're doing now, and you're oh. going to see results. You're going to see great results, and then you do a little bit better than that, and you still get great results, and you just follow that process. By the way, doing everything now won't get you there faster. So that's another misconception. People think, well, if I do everything perfect right now, mm. then I'll just get there faster. No, what will happen is you'll stop. Mm -hmm. you'll, fall off the, you'll fall off the wagon. It's not going to happen because you, know, you mentioned sleep and diet. Your relationship to exercise and your relationship to yourself, I'll say, is even more important. It those are even more important. When you say your relationship to yourself, um, so let's say I'm bringing a client to you who is, uh, she, she's been struggling with being 40 pounds overweight for years. And she can take off 20 and then, then put 25 back yeah. on, you know, the whole thing, yo-yo dieting. And um, I bring her to you. She, she's been struggling with this for forever. 
what, what are you going to tell her? What does she need? She wants to lose this weight. She's very serious about it. What, what does she need to do? She need to yeah. approach her diet first. Like what's, you know, you say we can't do everything all at once. Like what does she need to do first? Yeah, no, I'll, you know, I love that you asked that. Uh, and those are the kind of people that used to hire me. So I'll tell you a story first because it's going to help uh, me communicate um, to that person or what I'm going to, what I would do with that person. So years ago, I was at a, uh, a Christmas dinner. It was a tech company. So my ex-wife used to work in tech. I was in fitness, two very different worlds. Yeah. And uh, went to this dinner and we're sitting at this big table with her, um, you know, coworkers. And, you know, people are introducing themselves because there's spouses, uh, you know, all around the table that don't work there. Mm -hmm. And then when it comes to me, I'm like, oh, I, you know, I own a gym or whatever. And, you know, immediately when you say this, the people automatically become a little self-conscious of their yeah. food and they yeah. make comments like, oh, totally. don't look at me. I'm eating the spread or, you know, <laughs> or they'll comment on me like, oh, you're having wine. I thought you were a yeah, trainer or whatever. Exactly. So, totally. so that all starts to happen. You know, people in, who are in the fitness space know that. So that starts to happen. But then everybody kind of chills out. They see that I'm a normal guy. We have great conversation. And as the wine started to flow, this woman sitting across from me, she says, hey, Sal, she goes, you know, I had a friend who um, exercised every day, ate right, did everything perfectly, but then she got cancer at the age of 44 and then she died. And she said, you know, when that happened, I just said to myself, I'm just going to live life and enjoy life. I'm not going to do all that stuff. And two things really struck me about that. One, we don't know what's going to happen. So... Fitness and nutrition and health isn't about necessarily living longer. It's about living better. Because, I mean, I could get in a car today on the way home and God forbid something happened, right? Right. But the second part, this really struck me. I remember really I thought about this all night. I couldn't sleep. I said, I, I thought, you know, because I've heard that so many times. I've heard people say that, right? Like, why did you stop your workout? Why did you go off your, your nutrition plan? Oh, I just want to enjoy life. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you this. Is there anything you can do? that will positively impact every single aspect of your life from business to personal and every part of all of that, like just simply becoming more healthy. Mm. Like nothing can make everything better, like improving your health. That's right. And yet I have this woman sitting across from me saying she wants to enjoy her life. So she's not going to eat right. And she's not going to exercise. And I've heard that so many times. And I thought that is the craziest thing that people say, well, why do they say that? I hear it all the time. Mm -hmm. Well, here's why. And now I'm going to go back to this person that I'm talking to yeah. and what I said earlier about your relationship. People approach exercise like punishment. They look in the mirror and they don't say to themselves, you know what? Um, I haven't been taking care of myself very well for the last five years and I deserve to be cared for. I deserve to have better health. I'm going to go to the gym and care for myself. They don't say that. They look in the mirror and say, oh, my God, I'm disgusting. Mm. Oh, my God, I'm gross. I can't believe how lazy I am. You know what? I'm going to go to the gym and I'm going to sweat it off, burn it off, beat myself up. And so workouts that are excessive become cathartic. You know, how many times people have said that? Like they leave a workout crawling out of the gym mm -hmm. and you say, oh, my God, how was your workout? It was great. I almost threw up, right? Yeah. It's crazy. Like we never say that about anything else because it's coming from a place of self-hate. So exercise becomes a punishment. Diet or nutrition becomes restrictive. Yes. You offer a cookie to somebody in that mental space of I'm gross, I'm fat, I need to do something about this. And what do they say? No, 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 I can't. I can't. I can't. Yes, you can. Why don't you say I don't want it? Mm -hmm. Because I want it, but I can't. Mm -hmm. What happens to that person is they've literally created two identities. The child that they now identify with, I'm this lazy, out of shape, ugly, inadequate, whatever, insert terrible thing person, but I need to be tyrannized. I need somebody to look over me and oppress me. In fact, mm -hmm. I used to have people hire me like that. Why, why do you want to hire a personal trainer? I need someone to whip me into shape. Yeah. Right. So crazy. So that makes nutrition restrictive and it makes exercise punishment. So you're always going to work out wrong and you're always going to view diet as this restrictive thing. Mm -hmm. And eventually, eventually you get over, you, you can't hate yourself anymore. You, you get sick of hating yourself. You want to enjoy your life. You want to live your life. So this is why when people go off, they don't go off and have one cookie. What do they do? They have a whole box. They eat until they can't breathe anymore and they feel nauseated, right? So with that person, what I would say to them and wh where I would start with is there. How do you view nutrition? How do you view exercise? Let's look at this from a self-care standpoint. Now, starting there, do you believe that you're somebody that deserves to be cared for? 
do you think you can, you should care for yourself? Can you love yourself? Not the feeling, because that's hard, and the feeling comes and go, but through action. And then the steps. What are the steps? Well, here's the steps. I'll, gi- I'll give it to you. You know, and before you go to the, those steps, if you, if you don't mind. Yes. What, what you just said is very powerful. And I think it's quite remarkable when you look at food just like any other distraction, just like any other addiction. When somebody experiences self-loathing, when someone is experiencing, you know, negative thoughts towards themselves, they are dealing with past traumas. You cannot deny the connection between um, disordered eating and childhood trauma. Like it's quite remarkable. And I mean, under eating, I mean, you know, anorexia, orthorexia, um, overeating, bulimia, mm-hmm. all these things. And, and, but this isn't a drug food, if you will, isn't, isn't a drug that you can just like, you can't quit it cold Turkey. So whereas an alcoholic can say, I- I'm never going to drink again. Um, someone who's struggles with food as being there, the thing that they use as a distraction, as a way to numb themselves, as a way to, uh, take care of those feelings. Um, they have to learn how to manage that. It goes even deeper than that, Shaleen, because it's a dysfunctional relationship that we've worked on since we were a child. You know, nobody's done cocaine or drank alcohol since you, you know, imagine trying to stop alcohol if you've had this dysfunctional relationship since you were a kid. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's also viewed differently because, like you said, you have to have food. We also don't learn the skills to maneuver a modern life where food is cheap, mm. tasty, and it's hyper palatable. Yep. And it's everywhere. Mm hmm. You know what we learn to do with food? We learn to value it for one thing. It's palatability. That's it. Ask You, you see a group of friends deciding what they're having for lunch, and it mm-hmm. becomes like, well, I don't know if I, I kind of crave that, or Ooh, I don't yeah. feel like that, right? Um, here's what's, now, now, here's the thing. People watching this right now might think to themselves, might be thinking like, well, yeah, I mean, pizza tastes better than, you know, than a salad or vegetables or some salmon. Okay, that's true. I'm not going to lie. Pizza is delicious. Cake is delicious. Cookies are delicious. But that's not all the values that food provides, just like a partner, right? When you pick a life partner, their looks, that's one thing that's important, but you also want to look at their character, their loyalty. Are they growth minded? You know, what, like what kind of person they are like, that's all of that is extremely important, right? So the, the palatability of food, that's a real value, but you can learn literally, you can teach yourself and this happens by the way, the food industry knows this. And I'll give you some examples. You can teach yourself to crave and enjoy and desire foods that don't have the same palatability, but you've already connected through practice and awareness, which we can talk about, right. that this food makes me feel better when my digestion is off. Right. When I need more clarity because I have brain fog, then I can eat this way. Wow, I need more energy. I think I need this. Oh, tomorrow's heavy workout or hard workout. Here's the meal's going to be. And I actually want those things. I actually right want those things. Imagine, I mean, how hard would it be to stay healthy if you wanted to eat healthy? And that's, you can do that. By the way, that's balance. That's how you create balance because there is value in palatability too. Like if I, if I'm going out with some friends I haven't seen in a month and we want to hang out and connect, we might do so with some beer and some pizza because in the moment, that's the most important thing for my health is connecting with my friends. Yeah. But most of the time, that's not how I eat. So you can do this with yourself, but you have to learn First, you have to become aware and connect all those values to the food, and then it starts to become a part of who you are. By the way, again, I said the food industry does this, like um, beer commercials, right? Hot girls in the background, the beach, it's a party. where They're trying to show you drink this beer, have a lot of fun. Um, when you, Most people don't crave popcorn all the time, but when they go to the movies, what do they want? Popcorn. That's an association mm-hmm. that's created. You can do this if you become more aware, less distracted. When you eat, if you can ask yourself, how do I feel right now? Eat the food without distraction, right? Uh, not on your TV, not watching TV, not on your phone, not on your computer. Yeah. By the way, doing so will reduce your calories by about 10%, simply doing that. Just that. N- just that. You don't change anything else. You don't have to go keto. You don't have to go Mediterranean. Just No, just, just, put just your eat. Phone down. That's it. Um, yeah. And then ask yourself how you feel afterwards and pay attention. You'll start to connect some weird things like, oh, that's well, why because, I get you know, heartburn. There's something you said that I, I, I'm going to play devil's advocate for the person who's watching who's like, I do eat healthy. I am eating an unprocessed, primarily an unprocessed food diet for the most part. I mean, I'm living my life, but and, and I am exercising and I still cannot lose uh, the, these last 15 pounds. And 
you know, that person is like, I I'm doing all these things. Yeah. That's, that's the person who I want to help. Um, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, this whole discussion around Ozempic and, you know, yeah. smegliotides and this weight loss in injection that craze f the people who are using it for, for weight loss. Um, it's, it, it's really confusing me. I have to be honest, uh, because I hear so many doctors, um, in support of it. And, and a lot of people are like, you know, well, if that's what works and even myself, I think there are certain situations where that for weight loss, mm -hmm. it might be the lesser of two evils. Right. Um, but we also, I mean, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, maybe you've got more information about this than I do. P people are just eating less. That's yeah. why they're losing the weight. They're, they're eating. So they're restricting, right? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. It just, it just, it lowers your appetite. So if it, it just lowers your appetite that's it that there's nothing else that's happening other than no there's some other mechanisms about improving nothing insulin sensitivity nothing in terms of metabolism right so so mm -hmm. i assume i i don't know are there any long-term studies that you know that look at for example uh, muscle loss oh yeah you lose people lose muscle on 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 uh semaglutide and those class i think they're called glp1 um mm -hmm. agonists they they do because if you simply reduce your appetite and eat less and you're not sending a signal to build muscle, your body, just like the excess cardio, your body will then see, oh, I'm eating less calories. What it does is it brings its caloric uh, maintenance down yeah. to match it. Yeah. So you'll actually you'll actually lose muscle. But look, I'm not anti modern medicine. I'm actually pro modern medicine when used properly. But here's the problem with things like that: you're not fixing your relationship with food. You're still going to eat to numb yourself. You're still going to choose the wrong foods. You're not going to, you're not going to move in a way where you're going to develop this like lifelong fitness and health relationship. I'm I mean, you may making, have to take I'm this thing for an argument for it or against it. I really am not. I'm, I'm just genuinely curious about it. I don't think we know enough about it, but I'm going to say this, uh, that person who, you know, maybe they will develop. A, and the reason why I'm saying that they might develop a better relationship with food is, uh, recently went to dinner with a friend show up and I'm like, Oh my gosh, you look amazing, mm. which I hate myself for saying, because I know that can be a trigger. And, sure. But it's such an automatic response when you see someone who's lost a lot of weight. And the second I said, I'm like, Oh God, I said that. And she's like, yeah, you know, I've, uh, I've been taking this uh, injection. I think she's on Monjero. And um, she said, you know, what's crazy is I've done everything, 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 everything. And I, I wasn't eating like under a thousand calories a day. She goes, now I feel like I'm eating about the same amount, but I just feel disgusted when I look at anything that's like processed or fried. Mm. She goes, it's weird. It's just making me crave healthier food. It's making me not want to have alcohol. So to me, I'm like, well, in her particular situation, perhaps this is helping her to develop a better relationship with food. Yeah, so that's one. So that's maybe, and, and it definitely look um, like uh, like an antidepressant, right? You could be so depressed that it's hard for you to do the things that can help you feel better. Sometimes an antidepressant for some people can give them just enough so that they can go step out and do things. So I, I could see it being beneficial in that way. And look, uh, here's the deal. Um, I, again, I'm not anti these tools at all, but I think people are being oversold. Um, I think people may think it's a miracle. It may be for some people, but for a lot of people, it's not going to be. And even mm -hmm. if it was, look, here's the deal. Here's the deal. If we had a magic, this doesn't exist, but if we had a, a new pharmaceutical magic pill that you could swallow and literally get all the results you would get from a perfect workout routine and diet and never have to do those things, would you still get the same benefits? Would you still get all the benefits that you got from the growth and the learning and true, the body accepted, that, right? So yeah, yeah, now yeah. that now I know somebody right now who wants to lose thirty pounds doesn't care about those things, and it's like I just want to lose thirty pounds. But um, there's a lot you get through the journey. Actually, you get everything through the journey. The getting to the goal is is really a small percentage. Like think about any. Okay, here this is how I help people. Think about any huge goal or task that you had to accomplish that you really worked hard towards, right? Like making your first hundred thousand dollars, or building your first business, or um, getting my first house or losing 30 pounds or whatever. And then when you finally got there, when you finally got there, if you look back, all the value came from the journey. Very little came from actually getting there. It's like, oh yeah, I did build my first business, but man, when I look back, like 
I learned a lot through that yeah, process. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You know? Absolutely. I mean, education, I think is such a powerful way to permanently change your mind about something. You know, I, I hear a lot of people talk about intuitive eating, but it, I think it's impossible to have intuition around food when you haven't educated yourself yes. around how it works for you. I, I prefer educated eating, you know, like yes. I know how my body is going to respond. I know I understand educated eating means I know why I'm eating. I know that I'm doing it. Be I'm not hungry. It's just, this is the time that I eat. Okay. So I'm going to give you a list. Do you have a pen and a piece of paper? You might want to write this down. You know, I want to comment on something while he grabs that for yeah. me about, you said educated versus intu intuitive yeah. eating. Intuitive eating, it's a real thing, but here's, here's how it works. Okay. There's four stages of learning for anything that you want to learn. And the yeah. first stage is unconscious incompetence. Like you just don't know that you don't know. Okay. Then you move to conscious incompetence where you're like, oh, I don't know all this stuff. It's like the first time you went to start a business, then all of a sudden you're like, oh, look at all the stuff I don't know. Then you become consciously competent, meaning you have to think consciously about what you're doing in order to do the right thing. Okay. And then eventually, if you do it long enough or you practice it, you become unconsciously competent. Hmm. So to use an example, if you've ever watched a child learn how to walk, they when they first learn how to walk, they have to like pay attention to every step mm -hmm. and really focus that's conscious competence right like oh yeah oh, oh eventually like i don't walk that way like do you think about every step you take when you walk no it's it's unconscious it's unconscious competence if you practice building a good relationship with nutrition and exercise in yourself mm -hmm. if you start to become aware about how food really impacts all the things about you and how you use food and how you may abuse food and what cravings mean and what that how, how that feels all that stuff if you develop that over time um, you do develop a more intuitive approach to eating to where, you know, um, when I travel, when I come home, I want a big bowl of well-cooked vegetables because yes. that really helps my digestion. And when I travel, mm -hmm. it's really hard to get that. And I just, yeah. I, you know, when yeah. I know I'm going to do lots of podcasts, I crave a low carb, higher fat diet. I tend to feel sharper that way sure. when I'm training really hard and I'm trying to lift weights that I haven't lifted before. I tend to crave a higher calorie, higher carbohydrate diet. You know, this is now more of a new intuitive type of thing yeah. because like you said, I've become educated, but then eventually you practice it enough to where it becomes more of this kind of automatic thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the goal. And that's why when it's, it's hard sometimes when you want that for other people and they're not yeah. there, you know, and, and you want it to be easier. We want this stuff to be easier. It, it does get to a place where it can be almost automatic, like a habit, right? You wake up and no one has to discipline themselves to brush their teeth. They just do it. They, you That's do right. it because it's, you know, it's interesting to look at the studies of, um, patients who lose their memory or maybe even with Alzheimer's um, or amnesia and, and the certain habits are stored in an area of our brain where we don't, we don't have to force ourselves to do these things. And yes. so when you can create habits where it's like, oh, that's a trigger and it, you're just doing it automatically, you no longer have to rely on motivation and, and discipline, but it, getting people to that place is a process. And so that's yeah. what I wanted you to, um, oh, good. this list, um, okay. you're, I'm going to give you a list and you're going to, Give me uh, which of these you would have them do first. Okay. okay. So num number one, we'll say uh, move more. Okay. Number two would be uh, strength training. Number three would be cardio. Number four would be change your diet. Number five would be improve your sleep. Number six would be therapy. Oh, okay. Okay. So I am 50 pounds overweight. I've done the yo-yo dieting for the last 15 years. I've done all these things at one point or another, um, but it's not working. So what, what do I need to do? Like, okay. So you're not gonna like my answer because I, this is, this is where the coach in me comes out and people okay. will ask me stuff and I'll say, it depends. Right. So, yeah. Okay. So all of these are extremely important, by the way, you hit the nail on the head. Like you hit all of them. Okay. Uh, these are all the things that you're going to want to look at and, and, um, you know, modify in order to improve your health and fitness. Um, but here's the process for somebody watching right now. I'm going to make it easy for someone. Um, take one step. Do one thing that is challenging. Okay, it has to be challenging because otherwise it doesn't have any meaning. Mm -hmm. But realistic, and here's the context, okay? Realistic forever. Forever. So say to yourself, what's one thing that I can do 
in any of these categories, move more, strength training, cardio, diet, sleep, therapy, okay? I don't care what category. What's one thing I can do that I feel that's going to be a little challenging because it's new and I got to do it, but I feel like realistically I can maintain for the rest of my life. And use use that context because oftentimes we pursue these goals in a motivated state of mind. And the motivated mm. you always makes goals that the other you can't hit. This is just mm. – you take somebody who comes back, who comes home from like a business seminar or whatever, and I'm going to – all of a sudden it's like, okay, like I know you're really motivated right now. You're making goals that you're not going to be able to maintain. So you got to ask yourself, what can I do – that's challenging yet realistic forever. There's no wrong answers here, okay? So it can literally be, okay. I'm going to walk five minutes a day or I'm going to drink an extra glass of water or I'm going to go to the gym twice a week or I'm going to watch one therapy, you know, uh, you know, self-growth video a day. I, I don't care what it is, but start there. And then when that becomes a consistent part of your life, ask yourself the question again. What's another step I could take? That is challenging, yet realistic, forever. This is how you build the skill of discipline. Mm. This is how you do exactly what you said. You develop these behaviors, these habits that stick with you forever. Now, here's what it looks like. And I'm going to sound like a wizard right now for people who try this. be like, oh, my God, he said this, and it totally happened. Here's what it looks like. The first step is small. It's a little step. So people tend to, if they do this right, they'll take a small step first, right? Because they're not doing anything now or whatever they're doing now. They're going to take that first step. Like, okay, I'll take a step. Challenging, realistic forever. Then they'll do that, and then eventually they're going to be like, at some point, usually within a couple months, they're like, okay, this is like a part of my life now. I, I said walk five minutes a day. I'm doing it every day. I love it. Now this is kind of a part of my life. I'm going to do this again. The next step tends to be bigger, mm -hmm. and the gap between the steps tend to get smaller because discipline is a skill that you can develop. You can mm -hmm. develop the skill over time, and you can make – and these steps start to – it becomes a snowball. You get the snowball effect, and – you start to make bigger steps and the gaps between them start to get smaller mm -hmm. and you get that and that trajectory starts to speed up and and the odds of you falling back or the odds of you falling off completely are greatly diminished with this approach if you want to increase your odds of failing or falling off then you do what everybody does which is the everything at once approach like mm -hmm. that's it i'm going to go to the gym 5 days a week that's it i'm going to completely revamp my diet i'm going to cut all carbs out i'm going to change everything completely um that's that's it's it's not realistic long term. So the fail rate on that is like ninety percent. If we're looking at this list, um, and you've just said you can't do it all at once, e even to pick like one thing in each one of these categories might be overwhelming. How would you help somebody decide which you know if, if there is no wrong place yeah. to start? How would you help somebody decide which area is going to probably make the biggest difference for them to start making that like one step that they can maintain realistically okay. forever? So, okay, let me, let me tell, paint the scenario so that I could give the right answer. So let's say I'm talking with somebody and they approach me like this and I ask them questions about their lifestyle, mm -hmm. their diet, uh, exercise, and I, I find out that they walk like 2,000 steps a day. They literally wake up, they work from home, they sit all day long, they don't go on walks, they don't do anything, and then they, they go to bed. Yeah. An easy step may be to say um, to that person, hey, I want you to walk – after breakfast, lunch, and dinner, what's a realistic time amount for you? And they may say something like five minutes, 10 minutes. We'll start there. Or let's say I'm talking to somebody and we're going down the list and they're like, oh, my sleep is terrible. Like I get terrible sleep every single night um, and I know how much that can affect people. So then I'll say, okay, let's start there. Let's start with this. I want you to go to bed and wake up at the same time every single day because that's one step you could take. Is that realistic? And they'll say, uh, I don't know if that's realistic forever right now. I'll say, okay, well, let's try this then. Can you uh, wear blue blockers two hours before you go to bed or turn off your electronics two hours before you go to bed? Mm -hmm. And they may say like, yeah, I think I could do that. All right, let's start there. So it depends on where I see okay. the most potential so maybe for the person. For having somebody take a very honest assessment of each one of these areas and, and, and really ranking them. Because so, I think we know. I, yeah. you know, I think when we're forced to look at a list on paper, and I would challenge anyone who's listening or watching this to actually do that. Take out a pen and a piece of paper, write down those six categories. We'll put them up on the screen if you're watching on YouTube and just rank them on a scale of one to 10. Uh, one being you are completely missing the mark. 10 mm -hmm. is like, oh, I'm, I'm perfect in that area. And I think we kind of know, you know, I think we, we really do know like, uh, yeah, I've got some emotional baggage that um, I'm dealing with that it relates to my body image um, or I, I know I'm not moving enough 
I, I yes. think if we're really self-aware and we want to make a change, it starts with understanding what's my baseline? Where am I starting? You know, what's interesting about activity level, um, my parents got, they're in their 70s and they both got Apple Watches. Um, and they're, they're also apparently on the, you know, PR board for Apple, for these Apple Watches. They want everyone wow. to do it. And they're so proud of their steps. You know, what's interesting is my dad never goes to the gym, never quote exercises, right? But he's very fit. And um, I looked at his steps on his Apple Watch and I'm like, I consider myself really active because I go to the gym, you know, every day. But this dude never stops moving. Like he doubles my steps per day. Yeah. It, it's insane. But he's not exercising. Do you know what I mean? So it, yeah. it, it's about that activity and that movement. And one of the things I've heard you talk a lot about is a concept of, uh, of NEATS. Yeah. Can you explain that? Yeah, NEAT is non-exercise activity thermogenesis. And this is the non-planned exercise ways that you move that actually burn more calories for most people than their planned workouts do. So this is stuff that I used to scoff at as a new trainer. And again, I want to apologize to those early clients. This is like when you would hear the like, take the stairs instead of the elevator or park on the far end of the parking lot or stand at your desk instead of sitting at your desk or you know that kind of stuff, right? Because it's done on a daily, regular kind of frequent basis, it actually makes up more of a difference than your, you know, three days a week on the treadmill for an hour type of deal, right? So, like, you know when it, this first hit me? Uh, years ago, there was a uh, – this is one of the first pieces of fitness tech that was introduced to the market. It was called a, um, a body bug. Oh, yeah. I don't know if you remember. Body okay. bug. Oh, oh, heck yes. I was like – I wore a, um, a bedazzled body bug in, like, all my videos. Of course. Of course you did. Okay, so so body bug. These were great. Remember when they first came out? It was like totally. breakthrough. Like it told you how many calories you burned on a reg on a daily basis, and it was within like a pretty Very good degree accurate. of accuracy. Yeah. And uh, I remember clients would come back, and we'd upload it to the computer, and I'd look and I'd be like, "What did you do on Saturday?" And they'd be like, "Oh, I just you know I did some gardening and I washed the car and I went to the mall." I'm like, "Man, you did more movement on Saturday than you did on Wednesday when you hired me to train you." Hmm. Why? Because they were just kind of moving all day long. So you activity well, and, has and then, like on Wednesday, they're at work. It's a normal day. They're sitting at their desk. They're, they're inactive, but they got a workout. So we think that's being active. Okay. So think of it this way. You're going to love this because you're, you're so, um, I mean, you're so well-versed in the space. Okay. Think of activity as your hourly wage or, or your salary. So we're okay. going to use money terms here. Activity is earning money per hour. The way my body adapts is investments, okay? Mm. So I can move more, just like I can work more hours, and I could take that money and put it in an investment so it starts to make money for me, okay? So activity is your hourly wage. I'm going to move more. This is good for me. It's healthy. Strength training is an investment because it allows my body or teaches my body to burn more calories on its own. So that. you definitely want to do both, and the best combination is how can I make my normal day more active, don't try to make all these crazy workouts. Just like, how can I do what I normally do and just move more? Just trying to be more active, stand more, play with my kids more, um, you know, uh, walk instead of taking, you know, the, the elevator, that type of deal, right? How can I move more? And then those times I do have the time to work out and dedicate, how can I create an investment so my body burns those calories on its own? That's the strength training. So now you've got the beauty of this is how you create wealth. Well, this is how you create a long-term approach with, with fitness. Let me ask you, um, in the book, you talk about one of those investments being, you know, figuring out how you're going to get the best possible workout, like strength training, right? And, yeah. And you said, and which really kind of surprised me, that the best place to get a strength training workout is at home. Yeah. And I got to that chapter about a week after I had posted on social media answering my audience and they you know they were like um what, what's better the gym or at home and i said the gym because you mo the average person just does not have weights heavy enough to progress like so you, you just you bought up to 15 pound weights which at least when i was personal training i never ever went into a woman's home who had heavier than 15 pound weights i had to yeah. you know convince her to buy heavier than 15 pound weights and, and, and they were, were wondering why they had plateaued. Well, that's, that's all the weights you have. 
Yeah. No, great. I'm so glad you said that. So uh, first off, they're both great. I mean, anywhere you work out, if you apply it properly, is going to be amazing. Okay. The reason why I like home workouts so much is because it's easier to make it a part of your life. It's far more convenient. True. Um, if you have a family, which a lot of people who have kids, this is really gets tough. Like, okay, I got to go to the gym. Who's going to watch the kids? Yeah. What am I going to do? Um, it's great for the kids to see you do this, to be a part of it. Like it's, it's a wonderful activity for the family. Like, you know, we play music, the kids are over there. Yeah. I'm doing my exercise. Then they, and I don't even tell them to do anything. They come try and like emulate me or whatever. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> you don't need a lot of equipment. Um, to have a great workout. And there's many ways to progressively overload the body. One of them is to add more weight to the bar. That's a wonderful way. But you can also slow the reps down. Mm -hmm. You can also change the form and technique. You could change the tempo. There's many ways you can get the body to build muscle aside from just adding more weight to the bar. But even if it, even if that's what you want to do and you start to get into a pretty advanced level, like you could buy a decent home gym setup. setup. Like let's say a squat rack, a barbell, an adjustable bench and some adjustable dumbbells. We work with a company that one of our sponsors, PRX, makes a squat rack mm -hmm. that literally it, it folds into the wall. It comes off the yeah, wall. That's such a cool thing. Four inches, and then you pull it off, and you know it's got these arms that kind of come down, and it's more stable than like commercial gym uh, squat racks. Which so and gives people who need that space to park a car the ability car. to pull it up. Yeah, yeah, so and cool. it, and and you can make monthly payments, so it's like a. A gym membership or of course you could go to a gym a lot of gyms now are very yeah. very affordable nowadays but the lack of equipment is not uh there's, there's so much you could do without equipment okay. yeah yeah you know, that, kind of like answering the question which people will say what time should i work out yeah. and my answer is always whenever it is going to fit in with the yeah. least amount of uh schedule disruptions so where should you work out wherever it it's most doable Totally. Right. Totally. I mean, I, I didn't work out at the gym for the longest time I, I because I couldn't get a workout because people would, you know, they yeah. knew who I was. So they'd come up and ask questions. And now I don't have to worry about it. I can wear a hat, whatever. But um, I, I love that approach. You yeah. know, with strength training, especially for women, I'm finding that they, they, there's like everything we've been conditioned to believe we don't know what we're doing. We're going to do it wrong. So we have to mm. have an expert like, you know, design it for us and you walk into the gym, you kind of feel like an idiot. It's true that in a lot of gyms, the guys kind of like own the strength training space and you feel very intimidated and, you know, just knowing like, okay, what, how should I do my splits and how many reps, how many sets, when do yeah. I, how do I introduce periodization? And you do a really cool thing in your book of like giving people um, like periodization, like different places to start. And you break it down like um, inter like beginner, intermediate, advanced, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, yeah. And, and there's a workout with body weight. There's a workout with just bands. And then there's a workout with uh, with like a home gym setup. You know, it's funny you said that about gyms. Um, first off, everybody feels that way when they walk into a gym for the first time. Yeah. And I will say this, um, it's the most accepting place on earth for people who want to improve their fitness and health. Like I've been working out forever. And when somebody walks in and they've never worked out and you see them trying to work out, like I, I like all the meatheads in the gym, like we might be focused on doing our thing, but you ask us a question and we want to, we want to be, we want to help you out. Like it's, it's a great, and all of us were there at some point. So it's a wonderful environment, mm -hmm. but yes, it can be intimidating. Strength training has got a lot of moving parts, but I will say this, this, this will help. Um, don't view strength training like uh, as just a way to sweat and get sore. Look at the exercises like skills. They're mm. skills that you're going to learn. And don't do them to work out. Do them to practice and get better at the skills. So instead of going to the gym and saying, I'm going to go make my legs sore, think I'm going to go practice the skill of squatting or mm -hmm. practice the skill of lunging. I'm not going to mm -hmm. go to the gym to make my back sore. I'm going to go practice mm. the skill of deadlifting or rowing. You'll get more out of strength training that way. You'll get way more out of it. You're less likely to hurt yourself. And you'll get better at these exercises faster versus what a lot of people do, which is they view as ex an exercise as a means to an end. Like, oh, this is just to get my legs sore, so I'm just going to do it until I get really fatigued. No, no, yeah. no. Treat it like a skill. Treat it like a skill. You get way better results. Practice your lifts. Don't beat yourself up and go there to quote unquote work out. Go in there to practice and then watch what happens. You'll it'll feel it's funny because when people do it this way, they always come back to me and say, All right, this is weird, but I'm progressing, my body's changing, and I feel like I'm not 
working nearly as hard as I used to. So, well, you know, you can dig a hole with a spoon and that'll do a lot of work, but you're not going to get very far. You know, I'm teaching you how to use a shovel, right? I always recommend to people because it is a game changer. I don't know if you've ever, I'm sure you have, obviously, um, when, when you videotape yourself. Yeah. And, and really watch your form and then use that as a way of improving that skill. It's remarkable. I obviously was a personal trainer for many years in the fitness space, et cetera. But um, during COVID, or actually just before COVID, I decided to hire a personal trainer for the first time in my life. And I did so just because I, I felt like I'd hit some plateaus. And it was remarkable how much better I got because there yeah. was somebody there very closely watching my form or just the proprioception of like somebody touching your bicep when you're doing a bicep curl. And I'm like, wow, I've never, like, I've never thought so much about just the, the, you know, muscles and what, what's firing and the neurons and my form, like just having somebody watch my form. So yeah. you can't hire a personal trainer. If that's not in the budget, set up a tripod, open up your camera and, and film yourself going through some strength training exercises and i think you'll see how important it is to improve form how yeah. do you find that there are you know just just by working with somebody to under help them un, improve their technique that they can see changes improvements oh my, oh my god a good coach and trainer that's what you do i mean really you do good program design you guide the person through this process help them develop uh, really good behaviors and relationships with it and it's about technique and form because a good squat will give you tremendous value and a bad squat will give you terrible value or maybe even, you know, at worst hurt you, you know? Um, so look, I'll say this. One of the best investments someone can make is hiring a good, I have to say a good, right? A good coach or a good trainer. It's an, it's, it's, it, yes, it can be expensive, but it can be some of the best money you ever spent in terms of getting yourself there. Second would be to follow a good program where you can watch technique, copy the technique, where somebody's taking the time to write and create a good program that you can just follow. You don't want to necessarily go to the gym to just move. That's better than nothing unless you do it wrong and hurt yourself or mm -hmm. overdo it. Mm -hmm. But you want to have a plan. I mean, look, this is why we created the podcast. I mean, my, my co-host and I, we were trainers for two decades. And the goal was to create a podcast where we could communicate this to people so people could keep listening to get that coaching. Yeah. And then we created fitness programs so people could follow them and they have guidance. But we always say, because we're trainers, uh, the best thing you could do, uh, really, if you really want to just have your best chances, is find a really good coach or trainer to work with you and do it for a few months um, and then see what you could take from that. And if, it, if they're really good, you'll get tremendous value. Do you find, you know, personal question, do you find that your position, your job, your notoriety um, keeps you accountable? Does it put a certain amount of pressure on you to look a certain way? Do you ever think to yourself, like, I I've got to maintain a certain image because, you know, I'm going to run into people or, or they're seeing me yeah. on camera every day? You know what? If I started the podcast in my 20s, yeah, that would have been terrible. But, um, you know, we've talked about this on our show so many times. All of us got into working out because we were insecure, had some body image issues. You know, I, I thought I was too skinny all the time. I did a lot of work on that. And, um, I can say now it's always in the back of your mind. I don't think you ever really get rid of those, but, um, I, I don't, I, I do it now cause I love it. So I exercise and I eat right cause I love it. So the, the way I look is kind of a side effect. Um, we started a podcast specifically, you ready for this? This is, this might sound funny, but the reason why we chose the medium of a podcast was two reasons. One, it's long form, and I don't think you could communicate fitness effectively with mm -hmm. little clips and, and captions. It's like a conversation. Yeah. And number two, um, we did not want to sell fitness the way that everybody else does, which is look at my body, look mm -hmm. at this, look how sexy I am, look at the before and afters or whatever. It's like, no, we wanted to just, you hear us, hear us talk, hear us communicate, yeah. um, and, and that's what it's all about. So it wasn't about... Because that's what the fitness industry does, right? They they use that to sell, and I and it's effective, and I can see that you can use you can do it in the right way. But what it tends to do, and, and when, we never sold a program with before and after. We have thousands of before and afters. We don't we don't display them. We don't use them, and the reason why we don't is it 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 can promote wow. that body obsession. Yes. That like wow. this is all the value of fitness, and and trust me, our marketing team hates us. Like they're every month you need to use before and afters. We have so many of them. They'll sell so many programs. Absolutely. And it's like, you know, we, 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 we don't, I mean, uh, we're trainers at heart and it's like, we, 
you know, we know we know what the fitness industry's done wrong and we want to really do it differently. And if that means that we don't make as much money, so be it. That's really remarkable. I mean, I want to commend you guys for that. I think that unfortunately, um, that that's my beef with the fitness and the consumer fitness industry is that yeah. we we use those images and in doing so, we're glorifying yes. people who are really, really unhealthy in many cases. You know, I mean, I just I can't tell you how many people I've met who've been you know, on the covers of DVDs, uh, you know, the people who are on the television shows, and they talk about that being the absolute um, most unhealthy they'd ever been. And that's when people are like, Oh, my God, how do I want six pack abs like you, I want to look like you. And I still see some of these folks on Instagram and, and YouTube, wh wherever. And I, I, it kills me because I know we are, especially young, impressionable women, um, we're sending them into this place where they are they have unrealistic expectations what they have to do in order to look like that it cannot be maintained and it's going to do a number on their psyche and their metabolism and their health and their bone density and, and everything else and you'll never you'll never get what you want you know um arthur brooks a good friend of mine he's a he's a, a scientist and he's an expert on happiness and they actually they've actually they've actually quantified this and he says if you let's say on a scale of one to ten one being very unattractive, 10 being like a model. Mm -hmm. Let's say you were a five. And let's okay. say you spent five years trying to get yourself up that scale. You worked out, you did diet, you did plastic surgery, everything you possibly could, and you went from a five to an eight. He goes, your happiness would go up like 5%. The studies are very clear on this. So chasing that as a source yeah. of happiness, you know, when people get happy, when they, when they get fit and healthy, a lot of it's from the accomplishment and then the improved health. Absolutely. Not necessarily look, right. but you know, here's the other thing, like, especially today, Shaleen, like, um, with social media and I'm, I'm especially sensitive to this. I have two teenage kids and, mm -hmm. uh, my daughter for a second was struggling with this when you're without realizing it, when you're scrolling through and you're looking at all these fake health people. And I'm going to, I mean, this is true, by the way, there's more eating disorders in the fitness space than there is in the general pop, uh, population. Say it again. Ha like, ha like you, you're looking at some very dysfunctional people. Yeah. Oftentimes when you're looking at those pictures, but when you're scrolling through your brain, it views that as the everyday average world. And without realizing you start to compare yourself, this is just natural. Yep. Okay. So it's like, if I lived in the NBA, I'm six foot tall. I would feel very short because I would, I would think I was short. Right. So you're looking at these bodies, you're making these comparisons. You're starting to hate yourself more and more and more. And nothing you can do is ever going to solve that except for, Stop following those people. Change the algorithm so that what they put in front of you is stuff that makes you feel good, that improves growth, that uh, that things that you know bring you joy. And then when it comes to fitness and health, like, look, I'll tell you what. If you close your eyes and you picture yourself healthy, and I mean in the truest sense, physically, mentally, spiritually, financially, what does that person look like? They look amazing. Yeah. Okay. So the side effect of health is the looks that we want. The side effect of the looks that we want, if we just chase that and obsess over that is poor health. Mm -hmm. And then you, you end up not getting the, not only do you not get the looks, you actually get worse. So if you really want to look great, just chase health, chase good health and you'll get there. In all those areas. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I, and I love that you said that. Well, I, I can't thank you enough for the conversations that we've had and the the work really, like the commitment, the passion that all all of four of you guys have to making this not just a, a quick fix and it's super simple. You just do this, 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 and this. It, it's not. I mean, I, I wish it was, but it is a conversation. It is a process and it is so unique to each and every person. But some of those basic principles, like to hear them over and over and over again, I would have to t suggest that anyone who's isn't already listening to or following you guys on YouTube, my, the Mind Pump Show. You really need to because it's just, first of all, you guys are super entertaining, but it's it's authentic and it's real and it's honest. And I think you guys are doing an incredible job of accomplishing your mission of, of changing the way fitness and health are talked about. Thank you so much. That's a huge uh, compliment coming from someone like you. And I, and I also yeah. want to say thank you to you because when we hung out, we obviously did the podcast. We hit it off. Your husband's great too. We love you guys. <laughs> and um, you gave us some advice on uh, on our business, and you made a point that really stuck with us. And one thing you said was, you were talking to us about having a kind of low barrier to enter subscription 
uh, model where people could at least come in, pay a very, very low fee, and at least get some access to like good exercises and techniques and workouts. Tell me what to and, do. And I thought, you know what? You're right because like getting one of our complete programs will cost you around $100 and it's like a three-month program all laid out, the whole deal, right? But there's definitely people that are apprehensive and that is just enough of a barrier for them to not do anything, okay? Right. So we did that. We did what you said. Oh. We did on, on our Instagram page. I'm hearing about this. Yeah, so we did we on our Mind Pump Media page on Instagram, we have just created a subscription. It's literally, it's, it's $4.99 a month, so it's super, super inexpensive. And every week, uh, Justin, my co-host, um, he posts the workout. So you can literally go on there and have some instruction and some workouts for super, super inexpensive. And then if you want more detailed instruction and stuff, we have other, our other programs. But that was because of you. That was all your advice. Well, I'm, I'm flattered beyond. I think that's fantastic. And it's strength training, I assume. Yes. Yep. Okay, it's beautiful. all strength training. Yeah, that's fantastic. I love yeah. that. You know, because for so many people, it's not that they don't trust you. It's that they don't trust themselves. Sure. You know what I mean? And and that's what I find is like sometimes you have to prove to yourself that you're going to follow through first before you make that bigger commitment. And I mean, your stuff is so sound. And Brett and I went through it and it's just you guys are all great trainers and you really care. And it's not about the gimmicks. God, it's so embarrassing sometimes to think of the industry that I'm associated with when I see some of these workouts and I think, what are we doing? We're just trying to be creative. This yeah. is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. <laughs> We're going to hurt somebody. Nobody's going to be building strength. What are we doing? I We're know. just, you know, listen, there's only so many things, so many ways that you can build a bicep or, or do a squat. And we're just trying to be overly creative and at the, at what cost, like yeah. at the risk of injuring somebody just for entertainment purposes. I don't get it. Yeah. Well, what they're doing is they're trying to capture, um, the fitness industry does this well. People will get in that motivated state of mind because they look in the mirror, they hate themselves. That's it. I'm going to do something. And then the fitness industry grabs you with like, a. But you, you never know, did this before. Yeah, kick, yeah, this will kick your butt, and it's a new, you know, cowboy urban hip hop workout class, or this new boot camp, whatever. And it's like, you know, this new thing or whatever. And it's like, yeah. oh my gosh, it's terrible. No, you got to stick to the tried and true. Well, Sal, thank you so much for being here. I really do appreciate it, everyone. You be sure to check out below in our show notes uh, and description. Make sure you follow these guys wherever you listen to your podcast, and follow them on YouTube because they're really fun to watch too. You guys do a great job, very entertaining, and I very much appreciate our developing friendship. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, thanks for watching this episode of The Shaleen Show. If you enjoyed this episode, I really think you would love this episode because you know, we're talking about strengthening the body, helping you understand strength training, resistance training and lifting. So I think that this video will actually be very helpful. Also, if you haven't already, please make sure that you're subscribed to the channel. I appreciate that you've liked this video. And as always, I would love for you to comment below what you would like to see next, or maybe even your favorite takeaway from this episode. As always, I very much appreciate that you're here, that you've spent this time with me because it's the one thing that is most valuable and you can never get back. I love you. I mean it. And we'll talk to you soon.